Good morning and welcome to Walking with Jesus Through the Word, one chapter per day. I'm Pastor Jason Van Bemmel from Forest Hill Presbyterian Church. It's day 495. We're getting ever so closer to day 500. And uh, we are in the book of 2 Kings and 2 Kings chapter 10. Jehu has become king. He has killed Joram, the son of Ahab. He has killed Ahaziah, the king of Judah, who's made an alliance with Joram. And he's killed Jezebel, the mother of Joram, the widow of Ahab, king of Israel. Consequences have been meted out, but the judgment is not yet finished. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you for your word. Thank you for this time that we can spend in your word. Would you please be our teacher? Would you please write your word on our hearts? We ask this, Father, in Jesus' name and for his sake. Amen. All right. 2 Kings chapter 10. Now Ahab had 70 sons in Samaria. So Jehu wrote letters and sent them to Samaria, to the rulers of the city, to the elders, and to the guardians of the sons of Ahab, saying, Now then, as soon as this letter comes to you, seeing your master's sons are with you, and there are with you chariots and horses, fortified cities also, and weapons, select the best and fittest of your master's sons, and set him on his father's throne, and fight for your master's house. But they were exceedingly afraid, and said, Behold, two kings could not stand before him, how then can we stand? So he who was over the palace, and he who was over the city, together with the elders and the guardians, sent to Jehu, saying, We are your servants, and we will do all that you tell us. We will not make any one king. Do whatever is good in your eyes. Then he wrote to them a second letter, saying, If you are on my side, and if you are ready to obey me, take the heads of your master's sons and come meet me at Jezreel tomorrow at this time. Now the king's sons, seventy persons, were in were with the great men of the city who were bringing them up. And as soon as the letter came to them, they took the king's sons and slaughtered them, seventy persons, and put their heads in baskets and sent them to him at Jezreel. When the messenger came and told him, They have brought the heads of the king's sons, he said, Lay them in two heaps at the entrance of the gate until the morning. Then in the morning, when he went out, he stood and said to all the people, You are innocent. It was I who conspired against my master and killed him. But who struck down all these? Know then that there shall fall to the earth nothing of the word of the Lord, which the Lord spoke concerning the house of Ahab. For the Lord has done what he said by his servant Elijah. So Jehu struck down all who remained of the house of Ahab in Jezreel, all his great men and his close friends and his priests, until he left him none remaining. Then he went out to Samaria. On the way he was at beth Eked of the shepherds. Jehu met the relatives of Ahaziah king of Judah and said, Who are you? And they answered, We are the relatives of Ahaziah, and we came down to visit the royal princes and the sons of the queen mother. He said, Take them alive. And they took them alive and slaughtered them at the pit of beth Eked, forty-two persons, and he spared none of them. <clears throat> and when he departed from there, he met Jehonadab, of the son, the son of Rechab, coming to meet him. And he greeted him and said to him, Is your heart true to my heart, as mine is to yours? And Jehonadab said, It is. Jehu said, If it is, give me your hand. So he gave him his hand. And Jehu took him up with him into the chariot. And he said, Come with me and see my zeal for the Lord. So he had him ride in his chariot. And when he came to Samaria, he struck down all who remained to Ahab in Samaria, till he had wiped them out, according to the word of the Lord that he spoke to Elijah. Then Jehu assembled all the people and said to them, Ahab served Baal a little, but Jehu will serve him much. Now therefore call to me all the prophets of Baal, all his worshippers and all his priests, 
let none be missing, for I have a great sacrifice to offer to Baal. Whoever is missing shall not live. But Jehu did it with cunning in order to destroy the worshippers of Baal. And Jehu ordered, Sanctify a solemn assembly for Baal. So they proclaimed it. And Jehu sent throughout all Israel, and all the worshippers of Baal came, so that there was not a man left who did not come. And they entered the house of Baal, and the house of Baal was filled from one end to the other. He said to him who was in charge of the wardrobe, Bring out the vestments for all the worshippers of Baal. So he brought out the vestments for them. Then Jehu went into the house of Baal with Jehonadab, the son of Rechab, and he said to the worshippers of Baal, Search and see that there is no servant of the Lord here among you, but only the worshippers of Baal. Then they went in to offer sacrifices and burnt offerings. Now Jehu had stationed eighty men outside and said, The man who allows any of those whom I give into your hands to escape shall forfeit his life. So as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering, Jehu said to the guard and to the officers, Go in and strike them down, let not a man escape. So when they put them to the sword, the guard and the officers cast them out and went into the inner room of the house of Baal. <clears throat> and they brought out the pillar that was in the house of Baal and burned it. And they demolished the pillar of Baal and demolished the house of Baal and made it a latrine to this day. This, thus Jehu wiped out Baal from Israel. But Jehu did not turn aside from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, which he made Israel to sin, that is the golden calves that were in Bethel and Dan. And the Lord said to Jehu, Because you have done well in carrying out what is right in my eyes, and have done to the house of Ahab according to all that was in my heart, your sons of the fourth generation shall sit on the throne of Israel. But Jehu was not careful to walk in the law of the Lord, the God of Israel, with all his heart. He did not turn from the sins of Jeroboam, which he made Israel to sin. In those days, the Lord began to cut off parts of Israel. Haziel defeated them throughout the territory of Israel. From the Jordan eastward, all the land of Gilead and the Gadites and the Reubenites and the Manassites. From Arbor, which is in the valley of Arnon, that is Gilead and Bashan. Now the rest of the acts of Jehu and all that he did and all of his might, are they not written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel? So Jehu slept with his fathers, and they buried him in Samaria, and Jehoahaz his son reigned in his place. The time that Jehu reigned over Israel in Samaria was 28 years. Jehu, Jehu, Jehu. Now, a lot of this chapter is just shocking to us as modern readers. We think, wow, I mean, Ahab was bad and Jezebel was bad and Joram was bad. I get all that. But the 70 sons of Ahab, like, what did they do wrong? And all of those who belong to Ahab's household, what did they do wrong? Well, there's a couple of things here. One is that God pronounced judgment not only on Ahab, but upon all of his house. And it, it is God's absolute right to judge. God is the holy, holy, holy judge of all the earth. He never sins and never does wrong. And so if he passes sentence, if he makes a judgment, he is right and just in all of his ways. And he alone has the right to make these absolute judgments over life and death. The second, though, is a very practical reasoning, and that is any one of the sons of Ahab, had they survived, could have raised up a group to follow after them and could have claimed to be the rightful heir to the throne and could have caused a massive civil war in Israel and could have threatened the house of Jehu. And that's true of pretty much everybody who was in Ahab's house. So this was actually kind of standard procedure when you had a major change of dynasty because there are plenty of examples from the Bible and from secular history where if you leave out one or even two people they can lead an uprising that would overthrow the new dynasty uh, pretty quickly. So there's both a God-ordained judgment aspect to this, which is holy and just and right, and there's also a very real-world uh, political reality that's being dealt with here. 
And then Jehu decides the root cause of Ahab's unfaithfulness, the root cause of the sins of the house of Ahab was this Baal worship. And so he goes after the prophets of Baal in a very clever way. He pronounces himself to be a better servant of Baal than Ahab and calls upon all of the worshipers and priests of Baal to let none be missing. And so he gets all these thousands of people together and he has them all killed. The law of God, given with holiness and righteousness, the just law of God called for the death penalty for those who were idol worshipers. And while on an individual basis, there could be repentance and there could be a purchase of the ransom price to set someone free from that death penalty, this was a whole group of people who were not ashamed, not repentant, they were hard-hearted in their idolatry, and they were really the base of this movement that had led Israel so far astray from the Lord. And so again, God has the right to judge. He does. You know, when Jesus comes again, he's going to judge everyone who has rejected him, everyone who's hardened their heart against him, everyone who has denied him. And he will be just to do so. It will be deserved judgment. And we get a foreshadowing of this here with Jehu. That's what we see of Jesus here. I said that with yesterday's chapter two, that we see Jesus as the judge, but here we see it even more. And I think we get like a preview of the great day of the Lord when Jesus will come in judgment to judge the world because this is a sweeping judgment of the whole house of Ahab, of all the worshipers of Baal, and in that way, it's just a small preview of the final judgment that's going to come when Jesus comes again. That's sobering. That's something that a lot of pastors and you know Bible teachers don't want to talk about today. A lot of Christians don't want to think about it. We just want to think about Jesus as being the loving and the forgiving one, and there being grace and the gospel, and can't we just focus on the good news and on joy? But that good news and that joy is set up against the backdrop of what we deserve and what the world will receive, which is the judgment of God. We are delivered from the judgment of God, which we deserve and which the whole world is going to receive. And we need to remember that. Now, Jehu actually gets off to a good start here, but he doesn't go far enough because he doesn't get rid of the Baal worship. He doesn't get rid of, I'm sorry, he gets rid of the Baal worship. He doesn't get rid of the golden calves. He doesn't get rid of the sin of Jeroboam. Remember, the golden calves were the wrong worship of the right God. The golden calves were set up as ways for northern Israel to worship Yahweh, to worship the Lord God. But they were wrong. They were explicitly against the second commandment because they were graven images. And they were explicitly in rebellion of the Levitical priesthood and the Mosaic law and the proper worship of God, which was taking place at the temple. So he doesn't get rid of those. Maybe it was a political calculation for the same reason that Jeroboam established them in the first place. Eh, if I go so far as to get rid of these, then you know the people of God will all go to Jerusalem and they'll become loyal to the house of David again, which you could argue they should have done that. Uh, that would have been better for them to remain separated, but his obedience was incomplete. So he's blessed by the Lord for doing this good work of carrying out God's just wrath, but he's also not, his, his line will continue for four generations, but nothing after that because his, his obedience was incomplete and he will pass down this incomplete compromised obedience to his sons. We should not have incomplete obedience to the Lord. If we know the Lord's called us to do something, we should seek to obey him and trust him for the outcome and not make all sorts of calculated reasons why we can justify our partial obedience, which is really just our disobedience. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your grace to us, which has saved us from sin and judgment and eternal death that we deserve and that the rest of the world is going to receive. We thank you that you love us. We thank you that you've saved us. We ask that you would continue to be our Savior and our Lord. Be the one who rules over us. Help our obedience to be complete. Not that we're saved by our obedience, but we should be joyfully wanting to obey you 
because you have redeemed us and made us yours. Help us to do that today, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Well, that is 2 Kings 10. Tomorrow, Mike's going to be back. Uh, I think we're going back to the book of Acts. So, have a blessed day in the Lord. Thank you.